Welcome to TALES, the Teaching and Learning Excellence Series. In instructional development, we have the opportunity to go and observe a wide range of faculty, lecturers, and teaching assistants who request our consultation services. Each time I do this, I pick up great new ideas and insights that could be used in a broad range of courses. As instructors, though, you rarely have a chance to go and observe your colleagues' teaching. You go to their research colloquium, discuss possibilities for collaborating on grants, and perhaps talk about undergraduate research possibilities. But how many times this year have you observed the art of teaching in action? Similarly, our students get to experience many different courses, but are largely unaware of the enormous amount of time and energy that instructors spend designing their courses. We created the TALES series to help fill this void, to provide a window into the most inspirational classes taught by UCSB's fantastic instructors, and to provide a venue for them to share their thinking and strategies. We hope that this live presentation, in addition to the TALES podcast series that you've just seen a sneak peek of, will open up new stimulating conversations about teaching. Today, Dr. Helene Gardner will share her experience with telling tales in school. Dr. Gardner is the Environmental Studies Department first lecturer with potential security of employment and teaches environmental chemistry, pollution, and toxicology. Her teaching experience is extremely diverse, having taught chemistry and biology at Simons Rock College, a liberal arts college, private secondary schools, in special education at Santa Barbara High School, in the credit-free program at Santa Barbara City College, and in the home setting. Here at UCSB, she is known for making concepts stick through the art of storytelling. Please help me welcome Dr. Helene Gardner. Thanks, Lisa. <laughs> Thank you. Well, it's my privilege to be here today. It's my privilege to be on campus any day. It's my privilege to be in class with my students uh, multiple times a week. To tell tales in school is to harness the power of the spoken word in the classroom. Uh, this is me in uh, one of the older classrooms at UCSB. Um, uh, I was going to wear that jacket today so you'd recognize me and I forgot. Um, the student uh, in the back uh, with the antlers, I think that's a hat. Um, as Lisa said here at UCSB, I teach um, environmental chemistry, I teach air pollution, I teach environmental toxicology, and I teach um, a brand new course that I piloted this last fall in contaminants of emerging concern. Um, these are the new uh, toxicants we have to worry about. These are the things that are present in um, personal care products. These are pharmaceuticals, plastics, nanoparticles that leave our homes um, with the wastewater, go through wastewater treatment plants, get dumped into surface waters, and um, um, uh, have uh, an unusually uh, large number of them have um, hormonal effects, so they're very subtle. Um, there's nothing that I teach in any of the classes that I teach that a student can't find online, uh, which begs the question why the students come to class. Well, they are working on a degree, they need, a, they need credits, they need a grade. Um, and it's in this age of anything being available online, uh, the task of a teacher uh, has changed from being the fount of wisdom to um, something else. Uh, I see my job as threefold in this new age of education. One is to select from the world of information that is available out there uh, those topics that I want uh, my students to learn. Um, there is everything on the internet and there are actually things on the 
subject that I'm going to be teaching my students that can be found on the internet that I don't want my students to know. They're wrong, um, they're shorthand, they're sloppy, and I don't want my students um, to self-teach themselves um, those bad habits, those bad examples. Um, my second job is to engage the students in the, the topic material. Um, one of my ambitions as a teacher of science is to indicate to students just how important science is to them and how important they are to science. We have a lot of problems to solve and we are hoping that this next generation that we're raising up is going to be the generation to solve the problems. I'm hoping to create a crackle in the classroom that is not of dry paper that's been stored in the ivory tower of the academy for many years, um, ready to crumple, crumble at the touch of a hand, but crackle with the electricity of neurons firing uh, with excitement because I have turned on the students' brains in the classroom. I want students to understand that what I am teaching them is pertinent, it's relevant, it'll break their hearts, it will maybe give them a career trajectory, it will certainly, hopefully, um, give them a reason to live a life with a nod to science. Um, the last reason that I, or the last job that I have in the classroom is to hopefully make, uh, as Lisa alluded to, um, the topics that I teach stick to the sometime te sometimes Teflon brains of my students. Uh, I don't think I'm unusual in that I'll, I don't even remember all the courses I took when I was in college, let alone all of the things that I learned in those courses. And um, I'm egotistical enough that I want my students to remember what they learned in my classes. I want them to remember what's important to me. Uh, so the stories help me to do that. Stories are memorable. I use stories as a technique to make what I'm trying to transmit to them uh, sticky, make it memorable. Um, context helps us to remember the information that is housed in that format of the story. Uh, stories become icons for the concepts then. After I've told a story and attached a concept to it, students will often come back and say, the story uh, as a representative of the concept that I've taught them. And then uh, stories have stored and conveyed knowledge for millennia. Why not use a technique that works? I don't have to reinvent the wheel. I can use something that's out there and available for me to use, and I do. Uh, as I prepared for this, I realized that there are four uses to which I put stories um, in the classroom. One is to conduct a problem-solving session with students. The second is to establish a topic of discussion. We call this creating an anticipatory set in the world of education. Secondly is to establish an order of presentation of, of, a, of a bunch of concepts or create an agenda for how the course is going to go. And fourthly is to conclude a topic with an example. So I use examples both to introduce material and to close uh, as well as for problem solving and to establish an order of presentation. For example, uh, for conducting a problem solving session, um, uh, this is always articulated on my every syllabus that I have for class, any class I teach, um, an articulated 
course objective. Um, I want students to improve their problem solving skills and I use my uh, specific problem solving examples to exercise this um, with them. Um, I have never as a working scientist had a problem crawl up on my desk and lay out four possible options as an answer and, and then all I had to do was choose the right one, two of which were obviously incorrect, by the way. Uh, and then I had to just choose the one of two that might be correct. I've never had that happen, and I tell students this. Um, I have them write papers during the course of the quarter, which are always problems that I fling at them, and they don't like it that there are no guidelines and I say well this is how problems when you're out working are going to come at you uh, they don't come with guidelines so you have to sort this out uh, so it's a course objective so I like to throw out uh, when I use this as a, as a story when I use stories to work this objective in in the classroom a real historical problem, and a historical problem is important because we know what the answer is. I don't want to work with open-ended problems in class because I want students to arrive at the correct answer. Uh, and then I ask them um, what they feel they need to know to solve the problem. And as we're working through that, uh, as they give me their questions, I push on them for them to tell me what the hypothesis is that they are testing. Uh, frequently I get blank looks and that tells me that they don't realize how quickly they've worked through the scientific method. The scientific method is as natural as breathing uh, for human beings. Um, they uh, th Students uh, don't realize that in asking well, what I want to know is um, the concentration of X in medium Y. So, well, why do you want to know that? Well, I just want to know that. Well, if I lean on them, they can tell me that they have that their hypothesis is that there is some contaminant X in medium Y that is intoxicating the organisms. They didn't realize that they had a hypothesis that they were testing. So I like to slow them down, back them up, and make them realize that the question that they're asking is they're actually framing an experiment that they want to do, which is the testing of a hypothesis. And this is just old scientific method, chapter one of every science textbook. An unarticulated objective that I have in every class room that I teach in with every class that I teach is um, to appeal to every um, learning style. Um, it's not hard to speak to the auditory learners, literally and figuratively. It's not hard to meet the needs of the visual learners. Um, it's not hard to appeal to what we call the perfect Paulas as they fill out things. I have homework that, uh, that, uh, that is sometimes just filling things out to appeal to them. The kinesthetic learners, the hands-on learners, are a little trickier to meet the needs of in a college lecture format. Um, I have been told, uh, much to my delight, that um, some of these kinesthetic learners find these problem-solving exercises to be satisfying for their particular learning style. I've actually even had these students tell me that these problem-solving sessions remind them of an episode of House, um, hopefully with the crankiness and drug-seeking turned down. <laughs> I consider this high praise. I'm going to give you an example of um, a problem-solving exercise that I run on the first day of air quality class. Uh, it begins by finding um, a um, an account 
And I literally read it to the class. This is what I do. I read it to the class. On the night of the apocalypse, Ephraim Che was in his mud brick house on a cliff above Neos, a crater lake in the volcanic highlands of northwest Cameroon. Around 9 p.m., Che, a subsistence farmer with four children, heard a rumbling that sounded like a rock slide. Then a strange white mist rose from the lake. He told his children that it looked as if rain were on the way and went to bed feeling ill. Down below, near the lake's shore, Hali Masuli, a cow herd, and her four children had retired for the night. She also heard the rumbling. It sounded, she would recall, like the shouting of many voices. A great wind roared through her extended family's small compound of thatched huts, and she promptly passed out like a dead person, she says. At first light, Che headed downhill. Neos, normally crystal blue, had turned a dull red. When he reached the lake's sole outlet, a waterfall cascading down from a low spot in the shore, he found the falls to be uncharacteristically dry. At this moment, he noticed the silence. Even the usual morning chorus of songbirds and insects was absent. So frightened, his knees were shaking. He ran farther along the lake. Then he heard shrieking. It was Suli, in a frenzy of grief and horror. Ephraim, she cried, come here. Why are these people lying here? Why won't they move again? Chad tried to look away. Scattered about lay the bodies of Suli's children, 31 other members of her family, and their 400 cattle. Suli kept trying to shake her lifeless father awake. On that day, there were no flies on the dead, says Che. The flies were dead, too. He ran on downhill to the village of Lower Neos. There, nearly every one of the village's 1,000 residents was dead, including his parents, siblings, uncles, and aunts. I myself, I was crying, 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 he says. It was August 21st, 1986, the end of the world, or so Che believed at the time. So I read that to the students. It's always silent when I'm done reading a sad story. And then I ask the students what would they want to know if they had been tapped as one of the experts uh, who was uh, really uh, called on uh, almost instantaneously given enough time to pack an overnight bag and whisked away to uh, Cameroon to deal with this problem, to figure out what had happened so that it could be prevented from happening again. So at this point, I invite you to do the problem solving. What would you like to know? Yeah. Are there reports from nearby areas of similar tragedy? Excellent. And at this point, I would throw you a piece of candy <laughs> to reward you for participating in class. Um, are there reports from other areas? And I would ask you then, what is your hypothesis? Oh, I have like 15 going <laughs> right now. What was the hypothesis behind that particular experiment? Uh, that there's some sort of acute or centralized, I'm thinking chemical release of some sort. Okay. Okay, good. Thank you. Anybody else? Yeah. Okay. Uh, autopsies on the dead to find out if there are any substances. Now at this point, uh, so your, your uh, hypothesis is that there is a substance that has been toxic. Uh, at this point, I'm going to say, do you have an idea of what that toxic substance might be? Because to just run a pan, you know, to, to, to test for every possible tox toxic substance is going to uh, be very expensive. And I'm going to, to um, tell you that there isn't a lot of money out there for doing lots of experiments. So if you have an idea of what the substances you're looking for, or what class of substances you're looking for, that's, that's better than doing what we call a fishing expedition. 
Okay, something gaseous, good, okay. They're over here. Mine's a variation of that. I would want to know what was special about the survivors. Excellent question. Um, uh, my students, when I first started posing this question, when I first started doing this technique, uh, at, uh, I was very nervous. I didn't know if the students could do it. I've learned to relax. Every class has solved the problem. They get there in different ways. And the last couple of times I've asked that that very question has come up. The first couple of times I, I did this problem solving exercise, that question didn't come up. I don't know if students are getting more sophisticated or what, but you're absolutely right. And it goes, and the answer is, um, uh, most human characteristics follow a bell curve and there are some that are simply able to withstand what the toxicant was, uh, and some, most, not. Back there. Hi. You were gonna suggest heavy metals because we talked about heavy metals so much. Actually, I gotta get out of that spot. Um, uh, you're going to hear a story in a couple minutes that you're going to recognize. Um, because toxic metals are just present in the environment and um, not good for us. Um, okay, thank you. Yeah. I want to know about the lake. Want to know, what do you want to know about the lake? Uh, what kind of water circulation is in the lake? What, yeah. Excellent question. What kind of water circulation is in the lake? Did anybody else smell, did anybody smell rotten eggs and your hypothesis is? In the Santa Barbara near the oil company's uh, sour gas. Sour gas, okay. Um, also H2S smells like, right? Uh, uh, hydrogen disulfide is a nasty uh, toxic gas, yes. If you've examined the bodies, maybe you can tell if they suffocated. If they suffocated, exactly. Um, I'm gonna cut it off there and they did indeed uh, suffocate. Um, it is not a toxic substance per se, and of course, students know me. They have had some of them toxicology from me, and so they're expecting a toxic substance. As we work through this problem, a student will remember um, that the, that the um, lake started off blue and turned red. Another student will remember that uh, the outlet, which is normally a waterfall, was not flowing. Uh, somebody will remember that, a met, that uh, Ephraim saw a mist. Um, uh, somebody will remember that everything was dead, the insects, the birds, the cattle, the people. Um, this is, I don't assign collaborative work. It's too difficult to evaluate. But this is a wonderful example for the students to work as one brain in the classroom with different people throwing out different uh, things that they remember from the recitation and then bringing in their own experiences. Um, somebody will, will offer that uh, it was low-lying places that um, where the people died. Somebody will point out that there are gases that are heavier than air and that a, a, a gas that's heavier than air that doesn't have any oxygen in it will not support uh, aerobic respiration and will be a simple asphyxiant. We learn um, very quickly, um, or not so quickly, but it, we eventually get to the point where we understand that this is, remember, a volcanic lake. There is a, ma a magma chamber underneath the lake. There is carbon dioxide that comes up from that magma chamber and infiltrates the bottom of the lake. The issue of the turnover of the lake, you may recall from the, from the picture, uh, of the, from the map, that the, it's an equatorial location. So the lake is not turning over as it would in a temperate climate. So this carbon dioxide actually, um, gathers in the bottom of the lake, it stays there for decades, just accumulating and accumulating, even though it's a gas, it settles down there, it stays. Whether it was the rock slide, whether there was an earthquake that triggered the rock slide, that has never been determined, but something disrupted the accumulation of carbon dioxide in the bottom of the lake and it 
came jetting out of Lake Neos, carbon dioxide being heavier than air, then flowed down from the edges of the lake into the low-lying areas and uh, acted as a simple asphyxiant and killed everything that depended upon oxygen to live. The students solved the problem by themselves with me as an able guide. So that's an example of a problem-solving exercise. Another use to which I put um, stories, story use is um, to create an anticipatory set, establish a discussion topic. Uh, for example, uh, I'm going to read you another um, story that I use in air pollution class. We will never know what Jim was thinking that day. He was probably just trying to get a job done the quickest, easiest way he knew how. Some lengths of two and a half uh, inch uh, diameter galvanized pipe were to be welded up as part of a stock tank, we think. To weld them, they needed to the galvanizing removed. Jim burned off the zinc in his gas forge. Burning zinc looks similar to burning magnesium, which of course you all know what that looks like. It flares off white zinc oxide smoke and leaves heavy soot-like yellow and white oxide deposits where the smoke cools. In the metal working shop, we are often exposed to small amounts of zinc smoke without ill effect. It is common in brazing, casting brass, and occasionally welding. However, this was not a small amount of zinc smoke. It was thick enough in his well-ventilated shop that Jim wisely sent his helpers outside. Why he stayed, we will never know. There was so much zinc that it reacted with the forge lining, causing it to flake off. Around the door gasket area, there was a quarter of an inch, a sixteenth of an inch thick deposit of zinc oxide. There is no question that Jim was exposed to significant amounts of zinc oxide smoke as he removed the flaming parts from the forge and quenched them. After this event, Jim was very ill for a couple of days. He thought he was over it and went on a road trip. A week after the exposure, he came down with double pneumonia and had to be brought home. And a week later, he was dead. So that's interesting. So we have a mysterious death um, at the hands of zinc oxide. Um, what makes this particular example work is that we have seen it, um, we have seen zinc oxide before in the class. Uh, the previous story before this has been the air pollution event at Donora, Pennsylvania, which involves uh, zinc oxide, uh, among other things. Zinc oxide is not the culprit in that case. So the question that the students are, are left to grapple with is why, in the case of Donora, is zinc oxide not deadly, but in this case, uh, it is deadly? And the answer is uh, the particle size. And so we get to dive into particle size distributions, which is where we would have started if there had been no story. And believe me, uh, dissecting this uh, curve is not something the students enjoy doing. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> uh, after learning about this, the different modes in this uh, particle distribution, I'm not going to try to explain that to you. Uh, not that I don't think you're able, we just don't have time. Um, we learn about pulmonary anatomy. Uh, this is a model of pulmonary anatomy. Uh, again, not thrilled. Um, and then finally, I lay uh, the particle distribution over the pulmonary anatomy, and I find uh, we find where different size particles deposit in the lungs. And this is the answer to the question. And what propels us through these three boring presentations is Jim. You know, we're doing this for Jim. We don't want Jim to, well, no, Jim has already died. But we don't want anybody else to die because of what Jim died from. So uh, it, 
Uh, I've found that students will let me speak boringly uh, after I have um, spoken interestingly uh, with them, and the story uh, gives me the context to speak interestingly. What's more interesting than a, than a mystery death? Another use uh, that I put um, stories to in class is to set the agenda, set the order of presentation. Uh, an example that I use from toxicology uh, is um, f uh, involves um, a little girl who's six years old who presents uh, at a hospital in the month of April. Uh, she presents with uh, a disturbance in her gait, uh, a disturbance in her speech, and uh, with delirium. And I then do exactly uh, with, with this group that I did with um, the Lake Neos um, group, the air quality group, and say, what do you want to know? And uh, push them to tell me what the hypothesis is that they're testing. This is a far more complicated case and I collect their suggestions on the board. Uh, I let them go for a much longer time and I don't guide them as much. Uh, when it's time, I select from what they have given me uh, to make presentations uh, in, in, in the chronological order in which the case was solved. And again, this is a true, real case. Um, the students, um, I, I, I take this, this one example and run it for about five weeks, um, exploring lots of topics in basic toxicology. Um, uh, we find that the uh, girl's little sister uh, shows up about five weeks later, so the possibility of it being genetic comes up. Um, we ta uh, the, the next door neighbors come up, okay, so it's not genetic, but it's contagious, um, and it's something that affects children because it's the children next door that come down with it. Um, we discuss that possibility. Uh, eventually, the adults in the community and people further afield come down with this uh, disease, so it's not contagious. Um, Eventually, I back up. I give them a history of the community. This is a fishing village, but there is an industrial facility nearby. And, um, and I give them a little bit of the public health toxicology that, that went into this. At some point, the public health officials declared a, an epidemic and went out into the community to collect information. Um, things that they found were that there had been fish kills prior to this, that um, Cuttlefish had been moving so slowly that children could catch them with their bare hands, um, that uh, birds were flying into the ocean, that cats were spinning in circles, indeed that the people had developed a name for the disease that they called cats dancing disease. Um, eventually people die. Uh, uh, there are organs that come to autopsy. Uh, there are lesions in the brain. All of these um, symptoms that the wildlife had uh, suffered from suggested a neurological disorder. Uh, so uh, we talk about the importance of pathology. Uh, the students, when they find out that there is an industrial plant nearby, zero in on that. And as the student in the back was saying, um, the metals get uh, examined. We do a very dry reading of the symptoms that various uh, metals cause, and it turns out that none of them match the symptoms that uh, April has presented with, um, which is frustrating. Um, eventually, somebody does a very thorough uh, s a search of the literature. We learn about the value of doing a good literature search, uh, and methylmercury is uh, the toxicant that matches the symptoms. And so we learn about um, the mercury cycle. We learn that the environment can actually act on uh, metals and cause them to be methylated, which changes their solubility, which but then makes them bioaccumulate, biomagnify up the food chain. And then we end up back at um, 
public health toxicologies, if those uh, organisms lower on the food chain we can eat more of, those higher on the food chain we can eat fewer of. Um, I use this as a springboard to introduce the very fundamental concepts of toxicology, such as um, roots of exposure, absorption, distribution, metabolism, sequestration, uh, excretion, um, dose response, um, and so on. So I get a lot of mileage out of this. I had a student once say, I can't believe how much mileage you got out of that one example. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I end up um, with this picture. Um, and this was in a Life magazine when I was in high school. And uh, this is why I became a toxicologist. This is uh, the mother of, um, this is a, 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 a woman, and this is her teenage daughter who was um, exposed in utero. Um, they were both exposed. Uh, the daughter, obviously, is much more severely affected. Um, so that's an interesting discussion of dose and transplacental um, dosing, target organs, and so on. Um, but um, I, I like to share with the students what motivated me to become a toxicologist. So it gets, it gets personal, too. The last reason I tell stories in class is to conclude a discussion with an example. Uh, and this uh, is an example of metabolism. Um, the um, liver is the primary uh, organ of metabolism. And uh, there are enzymes in the organ, uh, in the liver, that are triggered to um, break down toxicants that come in from outside. Um, In the case of uh, alcohol, the primary, uh, the first step in metabolism is a breakdown uh, by alcohol uh, dehydrogenase, right here. So alcohol comes in, ethanol, uh, and then alcohol dehydrogenase. And then it, that's broken down uh, to uh, acetaldehyde, and then there's acetaldehyde dehydrogenase. And uh, one of the concepts that I want them to learn is that of tolerance. And Tolerance is just um, the um, phenomenon whereby the more of the toxicant that you see, and yes, we do in toxicology consider ethanol to be a toxicant, uh, the more of the toxicant that, that comes in that your liver sees, the more enzyme uh, that breaks it down is the liver is induced to make. We, the, we call this induction. And then I give them an example. Uh, so this is boring. Students hate learning about enzymes. But I give them a, a, a personal example. And the personal example is that when I came out here in 2007, uh, when my marriage uh, fell apart, um, uh, I went to uh, my sister's uh, annual fiesta party. Uh, now, my marriage had been a temperate marriage. Neither my husband nor I had come from homes where there was any drinking going on, and we didn't change that, and so we just didn't drink very much. And so I had a liver um, that was not used to seeing alcohol, so I had very little alcoholic dehydrogenase. And I went to my sister's, first fi uh, to, to, to my sister's fiesta party, and um, I had my first margarita, and I had to be carried off her back patio. Uh, and then I, you know, I lived here in Santa Barbara, and I got introduced to microbrew beer, and found out that I really like microbrew beer. And I spent the next year um, working on inducing my alcoholic dehydrogenase. <laughs> so I went to my sister's uh, fiesta party the following year, and I had three margaritas, and I got down off her back patio on my own power. <laughs> That was my sister you heard laughing. <laughs> so um, this becomes an icon. Uh, students, when I mention tolerance after this, say, you mean like at your sister? Yes, yes, that's what I'm talking about. I never live this example down. But it's, um, it, it makes the concept memorable. Uh, and uh, after they get over being shocked that I had my first m margarita when I was 50, 
um, they um, they get it. They they understand. So um, there are many good reasons to tell stories in the academic classroom, even in the science classroom. Uh, it gives students opportunities to practice problem solving. It introduces otherwise dry material. It serves as a starting point from which to spool out discussions of material, and it concludes otherwise dry material. Students, we, uh, seem never to outgrow our enjoyment of hearing stories and being read to. Uh, so if there are um, any uh, possibly dry concepts that you'd like to use stories to present, I can maybe help you with that, or if you have other questions, I'd be happy to uh, introduce, uh, I'd be happy to, to, to listen to them, to respond to them. We do have about five minutes for questions. If anyone has one they could think of. Anything you need to teach that, yeah? Does it ever happen that the students figure it out too quick and you have to you know, steer the discussion appropriately? Um, I have, n I have had, my only concern, the only time I've ever had that concern is with the methylmercury because they might have heard of that. Um, and I give the caveat up front. If you know what the answer is, please keep it to yourself so that your classmates can enjoy this exercise. So I'll throw a caveat out there like that. Um, the Lake Neos one, they, they never see coming. Uh, they expect uh, it to be a toxic substance. When it turns out to be a part of the environment, they're delighted. They're like, oh, wow, it's not just people that mess things up. Um, so they're happy. Um, I, I used to worry about all of that stuff. I used to try to drive things. Um, and I've kind of given up worrying about it. The, the classes never cease to amaze me. They're always capable. Um, it allows me to sit back and relax and enjoy it. And, um, and I really don't worry about that. The one that I do, uh, I, I throw out that disclaimer for. Just, just keep it to yourself so everybody else can enjoy. Yeah. I have a question about how you develop these stories. So what is the process? Because you do first think about the material that you have yeah. and connect it to. Right. I know what material I'm, I want to. Um, it, it varies with the course. Um, uh, in the environmental chemistry course, I start with radiation. Uh, I start with nuclear chemistry, which is an odd place to begin, and I s tell the story of Stan Stanley Watrous, who was the um, nuclear engineer who set off the um, detectors at the Limerick nuclear power plant outside of Philadelphia, uh, and, and people there thought he was um, getting radioactive inside the plant. This is very much like the story of how we knew that Chernobyl had run amok, because the Swedish nuclear power plant employees were setting off alarms and once the Swedes figured out that they were getting they weren't getting radioactive in the plant they were radioactive coming to work um, they realized that something elsewhere was going on and then they just looked downwind I actually tell that story in the toxicology class um, but uh, with Stanley, he was, he was coming to work radioactive and this was in the early 80s and we uh, uh, this was the event that put on the map the possibility that radon, uh, that, that people's homes could be radioactive. And this is why now when you sell your home, you have to have, a, you know, it has to be checked for radon. Um, so when I, when I knew that I wanted to start with, you know, this was a new class, that I wanted to start with nuclear chemistry, um, I went looking for and I knew about this. Uh, most, a lot of these stories I already know about because it's just, you know, my field, you know, it's my area of study, although it's pretty broad. Um, but I'll go looking. Uh, and I just Google first-hand accounts because I want that um, immediacy. I want y to make the students feel like they're there. Um, and so I, I go looking. And then I also have found um, 
first-hand accounts of people who have died of lung cancer in Sherman Oaks or in Simi Valley um, who were not smokers. Uh, and they, their families have found out after the fact that they had you know, a lot of radon in their homes. Um, and those are very compelling stories. It really, it really whacks. It whacks anybody that hears the story, not just the students. So it, it motivates them um, to, there's a reason to learn the material. Does that answer your question? Yeah, okay. Anybody else? Yeah. Is there a way to tell stories that aren't centered around people? I'm a geologist, so I'm uh -huh. doing things in distant time. Sure. Um, I talk about the Big Bang, um, and I think it, it, that event is a pretty darn compelling event. And you can, you know, I, I am a often uh, suggesting to my students that they use their imagination, imagine being there. And I. I'm always acting things out in class and, you know, blowing across the front of the room or whatever. Um, I gave up being embarrassed a long time ago in front of a group of students. Um, uh, and I think you can, I think if you lead, students will follow you. And if you ask them to imagine what it was like to be at the bottom of that um, inland sea that was receiving um, water from a variety of locations heavy with sediment and the sediment was filling in and filling in and what would that have felt like what would that have looked like if you had been present what would that have seemed like um, I think you can engage them that way even though it's not possible that they would have been there what would it have looked like had they been there um, I think you can engage them through their imaginations Not on, but there I hope you, you can hear me. Um, just one more round of applause, please, for our speaker, Dr. Helene <laughs> Gardner.